So I want to acknowledge others who have contributed to, to this work and uh, focus on uh, risk prediction equations, some novel, but mostly trying to get to action. And you've seen this nice, uh, wonderful presentation, Kai setting us up with the last decade, and Morgan Graham setting us up with some of this, and Harv Feldman in terms of the outcomes. The goals are to enumerate prediction equations, and we'll focus on the ones we've posted on ckdpcrisk.org, to discuss the wide range of outcomes. I think too often we've focused on too narrow a range of outcomes. We may need more. To emphasize the importance of specifying a number of variables that I'll talk about, and then importantly, connect the stages to calculated risk and to actions <clears throat> and medications, right? I think the emphasis is that um, we've now done well with the staging. I think the problem is when people think that the staging is the end, right? I think everybody who wrote the staging thought that's the beginning. We need to do more on cause. We need to then use GFR and albuminuria. It needs to guide things, but then you individualize to the patient. And the idea about this talk is that you can do a lot of that through risk equations in addition to just general thinking. This is a summary of all the equations that we've developed and some of the concepts of where you can go. And you can see each arrow starts at a given place. So if you start in a normal GFR, there's an equation for the risk of kidney failure over 15 years of a lifetime for kidney donor candidates. Now we have equations for the risk of incidence of CKD. And then there's the most widely used equation I'll talk about, the kidney failure risk equation that Nav Tangri and Andy Levy developed and then validated with the CKD Prognosis Consortium um, globally. Then we'll talk about the fact that this equation works incredibly well here, but not well at a GFR above 60. So there are new equations for the 40% decline, and then that's been developed in GFR over 60, under 60, and diabetes and no diabetes. We tried to develop equations for the risk of albuminuria. It turns out it's much better to measure albuminuria. We can't seem to predict who's going to have it and who you should test. Just measure the thing. It's not that correlated. But it's, it's amazing. People are like, well, maybe we can optimize this. It's like the whole test doesn't cost that much. Just do it. Uh, uh, and then there's the KDGO late stage CKD EGFR less than 60. You saw some of that. And then there's CVD risk. The risk of complications equations are important. Too often the cardiovascular equations have focused on their main message but our message has been, if you know the GFR is 25, why wouldn't you use that? I think too often the guidelines have tried to just use the categories by KDGO, which is good, but I think we can do better by altering those equations, and we've published on that uh, as well. Um, in terms of novel markers, I'll only show two slides. I think it's cool. We've seen lots of great stuff. I think it's super cool. But... I think interesting science can lead to new therapeutics and subphenotyping, which can be powerful in the future. But at least for me, prediction gains in what we've done, we've seen statistically significant results, but modest improvements in prediction, right? So this is an example, a paper by Morgan Grams. I guess it's easier to pick on friends than pick on somebody else. It's a paper from our group, right? She screened uh, ARA cohort, 9,000 people, 5,000 proteins, so tons of many millions of markers, replicated in another cohort in ARIC of 4,000 people, came up with 13 proteins, statistically significant, TNF-soluble receptor, other things, replicated in CRIC with one wonderful colleagues, 12 of the 13 things replicated, replicated again in ARIC and ASK, nine markers replicated. So it's great, adds to risk prediction, p-value of 10 to the minus fifth, but the C-statistics move from 0.76 to 0.77. So it's significant. If you need that for action, great. But if you forgot to measure albuminuria and you're back at 0.6 or you're not using any equation, let's make sure we at least start with the tools we have and then build to when we need the new tools. And then not to undersell this, I think this is fascinating. There's causal Mendelian randomization for one of the proteins and pointing out the idea for different causal mechanisms and targets. So I think we've got lots of new stuff. Uh, just to not pick on Morgan bad stuff, uh, Andy, Morgan, and Leslie did a summary that I just think is wonderful in six pages came out this month. I, I think she showed you the main slide, which I think summarizes a lot, and I've read this paper now twice, it shows the target population, which I showed you on the other slide. It shows you 
that has the outcomes, which are different outcomes, the time interval in years, the hazard ratios for GFR and ACR, typically for 30 mLs of GFR and eightfold ACR. I think it's important that by different outcomes, a GFR of 30 difference, like between 55 and 25, is a 29-fold hazard ratio in the KFRE, right? Because getting to dialysis depends on where you are today. So if I want to go from here to, you know, wherever, it depends on where I am today. Uh, albuminuria is important. It's how fast you're going has a relative hazard of 2.6, right? On the other hand, if you look at other things like 40% decline, sometimes if you start with a GFR greater than 40 and you're not diabetic, whether you're at 100 or 80 or 70 is not your biggest marker of progression. It's really the albuminuria that has more than a two-fold risk, right? So it matters which outcome, and it does matter what equation. Hazard ratios for ACR of greater than eight-fold vary from 3.9 to 1.3, so it matters, again, the weak end is for cardiovascular outcomes, the high end is for kidney outcomes. Albuminuria is incredibly consistent, and it's worth paying attention to all these equations. The predicted risk is important, right? It goes from less than 0.1% to 93% in KFRE alone. So there's a thousand-fold like variation in KFRE. Hardly anything does that, right? It's an amazing equation. I think equations that have more than tenfold risk variation are incredibly important, and we have tons of those, so we should look at that. And finally, the recommendation of connecting thresholds to action. I'll come back to, I think, uh, I think that's important, and in many ways, this conference about action can connect it through uh, thresholds. So back to all the equations, I'm gonna focus on the KFRE briefly. I think most of you know it. You know there is a four variable and an eight variable version. The AUC is 0.9. When we looked at that in 32 cohorts, 700,000 participants all over the globe, the C statistic was 0.9, and importantly, right around there, all over the globe. So this thing is useful anywhere, right? This is what it looks like when you plot it on the absolute scale. On the lowest decile, you have risks of 0.001%. At the highest group, you have risks of almost 90%. That's because when you look at going on dialysis, if you start with a GFR of 10 versus a GFR of 59, there's a big difference, right? That's the thing about these equations. They have tons of problems, but for the specificity of kidney outcome, we're doing better than anybody I know, right? I do a lot of cardiovascular research. It's Right? Then, if you look at variation between groups, there is variation, but this equation works everywhere. Right? Then if you adjust out all the variables and say, is there residual variation, there's about two-fold residual variation. And I suspect that when you do local prediction, you should always expect that there'll be about that much. But if your action is, don't miss the tenfold, a hundredfold, and then try and optimize the twofold. For me, it's often make sure the important stuff happens first, and risk is higher in North America than Europe, and that average factor has been corrected for. I think NAV has done well in pushing consistently thinking about action, and there's a series of papers of connecting threshold to action with the idea that at very high risk, 20 to 40 percent, over two years, planning for transplant or fistula is required, and it even goes higher for that. These are very high cost patients. If you're missing them, you're doing badly, and you can really tailor care and probably save costs in the very short run, right? 10% over two years, he's talking about team-based care, and three to 5% over five years, which is 1% per year, um, being seeing a nephrologist. But there's lots of patients before that, and a time horizon of more than five years is important. Above a GFR of 60, KFRE doesn't work, right? So I think it's great. It was developed for below 60. Above 60, you get a range of risk, but two things. One is, if the predicted risk is 0.001, the actual risk is like three times that in the higher risk group, and part of that is that it just wasn't made for that. But more importantly, when the predicted risk is 0.001 versus 0.002, it's a little weird to be acting on that. It's not the relevant outcome for somebody who has a GFR of 70 to say, will you go to failure in two to four years, right? It's a long road and nonlinear things will happen. 
Uh, I think we've worked on this paper that Morgan Grams has led uh, with uh, Nav Tangri, so it's actually a lot of the same people, so that rather than controversy, you get the consensus. And I wanted to thank the group and Kai in 2009 in that there was tons of controversy. I think KDGO has been good at bringing everybody to the room and saying, all right, do something rather than continuing to argue. Um, Morgan has shown you a more complicated slide. Eventually, this equation goes by diabetes and non-diabetes, GFR greater than 60 and less than 60. It can be computerized. But importantly, right, age for GFR decline is no longer protective. For kidney failure therapy, if you're 90, you're not going to get kidney failure therapy, but you could get declined. If you're 70 versus 40, right? Uh, GFR is important, but not the same 30-fold that you had for kidney failure. And albuminuria per log is 1.48, per 8-fold it's more than 2.5-fold, right? And now you get the calibration to be good. GFR slope will give you added value, but as Morgan said, 1.34 for more rapid than 3 ml per minute per year for the last few years, right? So you can get a little more, but you can get more by adding, if you have a history of heart failure, double the risk. If you have a history of CHD, another 40%. Hypertension, another 40%. Diabetes, funny, is captured in the albuminuria, right? So you always have to look at all the variables together, and you've got a number of variables. And the table shows you that a lot of the risk equations have like 4 to 12 variables. That gets hard to do in your head. Maybe people can do it. You've seen some of the empirical data that people can't necessarily do it. This is showing how the equations can make things more personalized than just the stages. It's not that the stages are bad. The stages are fabulous. From G3A1 to G5A3, the risk of kidney failure goes way up, as I've shown you. The heat map works. But if you're in G4A3, you're at high risk. But whether or not your risk is closer to 3% or closer to 30%, may matter, and maybe you can do this in your head, but uh, maybe a little bit of calculations will help. Now we've done this for the 40% decline, and you can see that the discrimination is excellent, but not quite as powerful as here. And then you can see if you're in G3B, for example, A2, um, uh, in this circle, right, it spans a risk of range, and, and Morgan and the others in the New England Journal paper have talked about thresholds for action. Potentially, some of these people may want to optimize medications and start end organ uh, protection. Some will need multiple medication, and some, even with multiple medications, are going to be on the high end of risk of the clinical trials where they need maximal therapy. And thank God, 20 years later, now we've got lots of options. So we need tools to guide those options, and I think this conference and in the time period uh, to the next guideline, we could potentially integrate tools to tell people when judgment is okay, but double check your judgment with some objective standards how you align, and you shouldn't be allowed to deviate from the guidelines too much if there's objective evidence. Two more slides, and that is... Um, we were interested again in older age, and we worked with Juan Jesus Carrero. In SCREAM, in the Swedish population, they had hundreds of thousands of statin C values, right? Because they've lowered the cost and they've just done it in the population. Didn't break the bank at all. Worked just fine, you know? Uh, and for KFRT, uh, the, right, the risk gradient with cystatin is no better than creatinine. I mean, it just turns out creatinine is really good and cystatin is really good at the high end more than the low end, so you don't get much improvement. For mortality, right, the black line here, and you can't see my pointer, but um, the black line um, here, right, you get a very U shape with creatinine alone because these are the people who have low muscle mass, not high filtration, right? But with Stan, you get a much more linear relationship and much steeper gradient at older age. So I think kidney disease is harmful at older age. You may need other markers to see it better, and there's a benefit of sustain at older age. CV death, you get a big benefit. Heart failure, you know, only maybe a twofold, but an important benefit. AKI, you get some benefit. So more markers, more outcomes, and I think it's important at older age as well. For the cardiovascular risk uh, equations, we can show that above and beyond the score and the pooled cohort equation in the U.S., you have another two-fold risk uh, enhancement by adding cardiovascular disease, by adding EGFR and albuminuria, and it usually comes at no cost because these patients should have these markers measured 
anyways, and you can actually get gain in decisions because it's not everybody's the same. It matters whether the person is 40 or 84. It matters whether or not they have heart failure or not. So in summary, very similar to the first slide, um, there are many validated risk prediction tools that exist for CKD. They give you 100 to 1,000 fold risk discrimination from the first to the 10th decile. They use four to 11 predictors. Um, the, they include, um, you know, these many equations. I, I think the summary recently is very nicely, you know, summarizes those and how they can be used. And I think the challenge, um, I think to all of us right now is connecting risk equations and thresholds to specific recommended actions, which I think can help physicians, can be very helpful, and I think require optimization if we decide that the approach is productive. Thank you.